benvinguts. Donarem pas a la xerrada del professor Rolf Hoffman. Simplement una veu introducció, ja sé que aquí he escoltat Rombell, unes poques paraules, així a mode de biografia. El professor Rolf Hoffman va néixer a Zofklov, que en aquells temps era Polònia, però ara rau és l'actual Ucraïna. Després de sobreviure a l'ocupació nazi, ell i el petit nucli ja supervivent van fer cap als Estats Units. A partir de 1949 i se sentaren a la ciutat de Nova York. Va estudiar a la Universitat de Colúmbia i també a la Universitat de Harvard i allà va ser introduït tant al món de la química com al món de la poesia. En aquell moment semblava més fàcil guanyar-se la vida com a químic, així que Hoffman va esdevenir-ne un químic i molt rellevant. I aparentment es transforma en un molt bon químic, atès que ha guanyat quasi tots els honors associats a aquesta nostra professió, destacant el Premi Nobel del 81 que va ser compartit amb Fukui. Dins del procés aquest d'ensenyar els químics com jugar amb les orbitals moleculars a partir de la meitat de la seva vida, el professor Hoffman començà a escriure poesia, encara que també ha escrit altres llibres com a de divulgació, assajos i fins i tot obres de teatre, oxigen amb Cal Giragi. Quatre col·leccions dels seus poemes i diverses obres individuals s'han imprès als Estats Units i ahir mateix hi ha hagut altres traduccions i ahir mateix es presentava una traducció al castellà a la Societat Catalana de Química. Concretament, el president de la Societat Catalana de Química va avançar que, a part d'un gran químic, un gran poeta, també ha estat un gran divulgador d'aquesta nostra ciència. I simplement vull mencionar unes paraules d'ell mateix en un assaig. Es deia Reflections on Art in a Science. En el professor Hoffman ha dit que l'art in a science would be both part of me was clear from college days at Columbia University. The wall opened up with the help of Mark Van Doren in poetry, Donald Keen in Japanese literature, or Howard MacFarlane Davis in Renaissance art. In the end, I had the courage to tell my parents I didn't want to be a doctor, but not enough courage to tell them I wanted to study history. Though it certainly wasn't obvious at the beginning, chemistry proved to be a wonderful compromise. Art, always there to be contemplated or read, then came directly into my life. In midlife, I began to write first poetry, then essays like this one, then plays. In time, I carved out my own land to ex poetry, philosophy, and chemistry. Va més enllà i també ens mostra com l'art i la ciència estan molt lligats. Ens parla amb aquest mateix assaig de tot l'art que està inclòs en els nostres articles. Fa una anàlisi de tota una sèrie d'articles de la Journal of the American Chemical Society i totes les figures que hi inclouen. També va dintre la poesia i ens parla el mateix. Hi ha un poema molt bonic de la mecànica quàntica, però repeteixo, no esteu aquí per escoltar-me a mi, sinó a ell mateix. So, professor Hoffman, thanks for having accepted our invitation to be at the faculty and both at the Institute of Computational and Theoretical Chemistry and the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I... So, first of all, I have been told, well, all of you know better than I that it is cold now, but it'll get warmer later. <laughs> and you will supply some of the heat that is going to warm up this room. Um, I'm always very happy to be here. It is many years and uh, for instance, it was good to see Jaume to, uh, to uh, remember the, my first visits to, to Barcelona. Um, I'm going, this is a lecture is going to last two hours or so with a break. Is the, there is a, a resonance somewhere. Let's see the feedback there. Maybe that'll be better. Yes, can you, can you hear me now? Yes, good. If any seats are needed, there are, you have to come up front to sit. The professors have taken all the seats in the back. 
um, so uh, they're going to be, uh, I have tried to give this talk at various times in one hour, it's impossible. So we'll have to do it with two hours with a break in between. Um, I, let me begin with these two statements, which most of the people in theoretical chemistry know. Uh, they are interesting. The first one by Charles Coulson was recorded from an after dinner talk. And it's, a, it's an observation on, on chemistry uh, about the chemical bond. He describes a bond. You can read Oye, it. Michi, no veo. Me aparece uh, una pantalla en mi ordenador. Es que yo nunca he utilizado este chisme, so ¿sabes? So este... Entonces. Uh, that I can almost see it. And then I ya, pero, the no, pero digo que es que yo estoy viendo aquí las diapositivas de Robert Mulliken y, y de Charles Curson, pero a él no le veo. Does not speak so ah, well about vale, science. vale, 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 gracias. That Charles Coulson, who was uh, a man I admired uh, and who also in an interesting way bridged science and religion. He was a minister as well. Um, it, it, it's an accident that this was recorded, this, this for posterity, and yet it's something interesting to say. Uh, and that is science does not leave much room for the, for such for statements that are thoughtful in some way like this one. And then there's Robert Malik and I believe the chemical bond is not so simple as some people seem to think. This is typical Malik and if you ever look at or if you had to look at some of Malik papers, you would see that there are footnotes among uh, uh, footnotes about footnotes. There are reservations, caveats in everything that he says. And so this is typical Mulliken. Let me just sketch for you the evolution of the idea. And this is not a very, very good historical sketch beginning uh, with Robert Boyle, the idea of an element. Interesting that in this historical sketch, Lavoisier does not appear, the marker of modern chemistry. Um, and because he really uh, did not think much about this, he did think about the elements. There is Dalton's idea of the, of the atom, uh, Laurent, uh, uh, the idea of a molecule. And then there, after the beginnings, there is an explosion in 20 years from 1850 to 1874 in which the ideas become well-formed through the work of a very international group of people, which includes a Russian, Englishman, uh, some French workers initially, eventually Germans become active, and which comes up in the uh, pictures of or representations of molecules, which are beginning to look like, which look like modern ones. In 1874, we see the extension into space uh, of uh, Van Hoff and Lebel's ideas very differently formed. In 1916, things are quiet for a while. 1916, during World War I and not talking to each other, Lewis and Kossel come up with the idea of a bond as a shared electron pair. At the same time, and with chemists paying zero attention to it, X-ray crystallography is developed to, um, to give us the first structures of molecules in diamonds, so, uh, sodium chloride and graphite eventually. Chemical crystallography and bond metrics begins and then comes uh, something in the old quantum mechanics that doesn't seem to say very much about molecules, but I'll show you something in the break at the, around the time of the break in the talk about uh, what Bohr, how Bohr thought about molecules. Uh, but um, in, with the new quantum mechanics, 
one rapid development after the other. And then the first papers by Heitler, London, and H2, and then are followed by the beginnings of numerical calculations with James and Coolidge later on, and then come Pauling and Mulliken and valence bond MO theories. Um, down here are some books which have um, looked at this period. These are the English language books. There are so also some French language ones. Uh, the one by Rock on Image and Reality has a cumbersome title, but it discusses this 20 year period of rapid generation of chemical structures very well. Okay, so what do people do in the beginning? They get, uh, they get atoms and elements and that atoms have different weights. The symbols for the elements are settled on early on through the authority um, of uh, Berzelius. And so one sees carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, much as like one sees today, the symbols for these. What is not, the stoichiometry is more or less settled for simple molecules, except that there is a period of confusion from Dalton on till a famous conference in the 1860s in Karlsruhe, in which the atomic weight of the elements is settled. That is, people know that the oxygen and water contributes most of the mass to the water, but whether it is eight to one or 16 to one, depends on whether you assume water is H2O or OH. And in the usual way that human beings have of thinking that the world is as simple as their minds, people assume it's OH. What else? Uh, and so without doing the experiments to try to figure out. And so they, for a long time, there is a, uh, the wrong molecular masses are there. The thing that is not settled, and it is sort of amusing today, is something as simple as whether you write the relative number of atoms in a formula as a subscript or as a superscript. There is no international agreement. So of course, if you have two people, they will write it in two different ways. And that is what you see here. Uh, you see sometimes a superscript, sometimes a subscript. What you see in a formula like Whistle Senior's formula in 1863, in the middle of this period of rapid development for a lactic acid, what you see, I choose to see it as a desperate attempt by a thinking human being to try to show what's connected to what. That's all. That's what they're doing. People, if you want to come in, there are seats in front here, uh, all over here. One interesting thing is people do make models. These are uh, the other Hoffmann, August Wilhelm von Hoffmann's physical models from 1865 of the simplest molecules. They look very much like we would build models today. Please come here if you want to sit. Uh, the only thing is they all have square planar carbon. That's okay, he didn't know better. This is before Van Tauf and Lebel, and it took us some time to get back to the idea, but here is ethane, C2H6, and uh, it has different names. Here is the, some of the formulas, what what Kekulé called sausage formulas. So, worst formal. This carbon here is, he actually built these, as you see here, from four balls of steel that were connected to each other. Uh, and this little sausage here is, with four connections, is the tetravalence of carbon. That's how he displayed it. And here is his formula for uh, a 
as you see here, for methyl chloride. A carbon that's connected uses its four valences to connect up the three hydrogens and the chlorine. Perfectly understandable. Uh, for it's a little difficult to make. Here is his wonderful formula, absolutely correct from Kekulé's 1861 book for acetic acid. A methyl group, a carbon with three hydrogens, connected by a single bond to a carbon that has a double bond to a carbon to an oxygen, and then a single bond to an OH. So you have to know what's connected to what and what's not connected. But human beings can do that very well. All kinds of very interesting things in this period. Here is, for instance, preserved an original model by Kekulé. Kekulé in 1860, in a series of several papers, runs through about um, three or four different uh, representations of benzene. And this is one of his. So take a little look at this. This is a carbon atom with four valences connected uh, by one bond to another carbon atom with four valences. And then this one's connected by a double bond over here, a single bond over here. And it doesn't have a D6H geometry, but it's perfectly understandable. These are the two resonance structures of benzene written in this model personified. So interesting. We see the evolution. Uh, they were called type formulas in English. Um, and what that stood for was there was a phenol and a methyl, they're connected to each other. Here's toluene and phenol. Are, and uh, they are, uh, the types refer to <coughs> The groups that tend to stick together, uh, phenol, methyl over here. Here is, for instance, phenol. And in the beginning, the OH group always stuck together. So it was grouped together with a parenthesis. But then later, they learned how to break into the OH bond of phenol. They essentially saw the acidic function of phenol. And uh, they, uh, then they, they drew a line in between. The line was a connection. Eventually, by the end of Kekulé's uh, experimentation with various things, one had formulas that look pretty much like our structural formulas, and which we then, for from 1865 on, at least many of the more forward-looking chemists drew in this form like this. And then what follows is Lewis structures uh, or causal structures for some of these things. And the line was now reinterpreted in view of the growing electron theory. One still had in Lewis's time only the old quantum mechanics. One had the electron only relatively recently um, thrown into this picture, one, one drew, one interpreted the line as an electron pair. And then Linus Pauling comes in, working uh, in a different place from Lewis and not necessarily getting along with him at various times. And uh, Linus Pauling uh, in reinterprets, I'm sorry, uh, this, uh, this, uh, a line here, see here, as a valence bond and gives it a wave function interpretation. There's much more one could say. What is going on here? What is going on here is, as I told you in words, people desperately trying to tell other people what is connected to what else. Nothing very sophisticated. But what's going on is representation. Now, people in other parts of uh, communication uh, have, have been very interested in representation, very roughly representation of things that is making a model, uh, knowing that it's, that it's a model, that it's not reality, that it stands for something, 
uh, we haven't talked about microscopic, macroscopic. Uh, representation comes as either symbolic or iconic as two extremes. I mean, an iconic representation is a no smoking sign. Um, one hopes understandable across cultures. So some iconic representations like the marking for a male or female bathroom are not so understandable across cultures. Uh, this is a symbolic representation, uh, which has zero meaning to Americans until they get a ticket. Uh, but of course has a meaning that is, it does not stand for even in rough form for what it, what it means. Um, and in this case, a no parking sign. So what is going on here is representation. And now there comes something else. And this is, has a name in philosophy. It's called reification, a lovely word, which means that the things in our mind become solidified and get another represent, get identified with another representation. Uh, my friend, Emily Gross holds a, a poet has called this about ideas becoming the furniture of the mind. Uh, and so this line, which all it meant if you asked Kekule was that those two things are connected to each other and they stay reasonably connected to each other through some chemical transformations. Uh, that got reinterpreted into something which became much more, much more solid. And now comes lots of other changes which are less revolutionary then they seem, they're gradual. They're associated with people who reinterpret things. The gra there is more, it's more of a gradual and punctuated change. And when it's done, that change, like what Lewis does to Kekulé structures and what Pauling does to Lewis and Kekulé structures. So those guys, have learned that if you want to institute change, you don't usually use a revolutionary nomenclature or some new ideas. Sometimes you do. There is an interesting contrast here for those of you who know history of science with the, with the initial chapter of Lavoisier's um, of Lavoisier's 1789 book where, where he talks about the need for a new nomenclature. It's usually there because they want people to believe what they say, they take the new and put it in the old language, which is interesting. And that's why I say this is done with appropriation, co-option, parallel and ambiguous terminology. It's almost never, never malicious. These people are not doing this. They're just doing this to convince other people. That's all of what they have. They don't mean anything bad. It's very human and it's mostly productive. It leads to some new chemistry. This is not Kuhn. This is not scientific revolutions. It is certainly not the malicious genius of fire oven, um, that anything goes. Uh, it's something more like Peter Gallison, who is a contemporary hi historian, philosopher of science at Harvard, who talks about pigeon languages. He talks about the languages that people use in trading zones in order to communicate with each other. It's not one language, it's not another language but it has a good purpose in doing it. And so, and sometimes it becomes a new language. It's a little bit of what's going on. So what do we have left now? I'm going to try to show you in two hours that we have this seemingly vague definition of the chemical bond as a reasonably persistent connection between atoms. Uh, and it's, it's not, it seems vague, but it, every word here has, I will show you has meaning. In the first hour, I will talk about experimental measures. 
and in a second hour about theoretical measures. Uh, ways of probing experimentally. We're going to talk first about distances, which of course are obtained uh, by uh, various techniques from X-ray diffraction, neutron diffraction, a few from uh, microwave spectroscopy. There was a wave of electron diffraction that's returning with cryo microscopy. Um, we're going to talk about distances. Uh, we're going to talk about dissociation energies. That's another characteristic of bonds. Uh, force constants or vibrational frequencies. We'll talk a little bit in passing about binding electron densities. Um, and then we'll talk about much, I'll do much less justice to magnetic and spectroscopic criteria for bonding. And eventually uh, finish up with saying some good and bad things about scanning tunneling microscopy. Uh, and the more modern ways that we have of imaging. Now, in some ways we cannot go back. So I cannot, I cannot discuss these methods without showing you where we are with the new quantum mechanics after about 1932. And that is that we have potential energy curve, for instance, for a diatomic molecule like H2, and in that curve, there are, there are quantized electronic levels, there are quantized um, vibrational levels in this, and that the properties may depend on what vibrational level you are in. We are very well aware of the effect of temperature, that if at a higher temperature, there may be an effectively different structure. Um, and we, that there's a difference between uh, the bottom of this curve and the properties in the first vibrational level. So we're, also, we're now used to the, to the thinking in, in those terms. So first about X-ray diffraction. Um, I grew up in a, scientifically in working with Lipscomb, an X-ray crystallographer. Uh, the machines look, are smaller and less expensive, but actually the, the price has stayed about the same. For about uh, 200 kilo euros, you can get a very nice uh, X-ray diffractometer. Uh, and you get, if the molecules cooperate, macroscopic molecules cooperate in giving you crystals. Uh, and there is an art in growing those crystals and the science. You can get a diffraction pattern. This is not talking about discrete molecules. You can produce, uh, you can do a Fourier transform. You get a, a, the electron density out of it. And eventually you get the structure of a molecule. It happens to be a binuclear complex. Doesn't matter what it is, the process when I worked with Lipscomb, this was a half year project for a graduate student. That's very hard for someone to, that's if, the, if you got the crystals. Uh, today, this is a half hour uh, for, unless the molecule is, is a problem in some way. So things have changed. The price hasn't changed, interestingly, about um, the number of such structures is very large. Um, in the, uh, old days, they began to compile these first in books and then eventually on a computer. And there are several compilations, organic and inorganic. Um, there are, let's just get an idea of the overall dimensions. Chemists through 150, 200 years of frenetic activity have made about 120 to 150 million uh, discrete compounds that are pure to a certain extent. They're not, they're not very pure and some of them are never going to be pure. Um, of those 100 million compounds, X-ray crystallography has been so successful 
that 1% of them have had their x-ray structures done. That's a large number. It's, it's a, it gives a tremendous database being added to at um, a very large number each year and obviously easy to, do, to put into a computer system and to analyze the day through various data processing, processing tools, a, a tremendous store of information. So if you want to know what is the length of a CC bond today, do not ask a theoretician. Go to the Cambridge Structural Database and with the tools that are available there, if, if what you mean by a CC single bond is a bond between two carbons that have four groups bonded to each other, then you can specify that. Uh, the Cambridge file, incidentally, there is an inorganic file as well. Uh, there is, uh, a, which has maybe 200,000, actually are about three different inorganic compound files. There is a protein data bank and there are information, several theoretical data banks, which uh, are also available for searching. Um, these, um, uh, it, the, um, when you search to that, for instance, uh, I don't, I think at one seminar I mentioned this and Jay Siegel, who some of you may know, said, well, I'll do this and I'll ask the Cambridge database, what is the length of a CC bond in the language that the database understands? And the database gave him the logical answer for CC bonds, and that is, um, it actually, uh, at that point, someone playfully had programmed something saying, you don't want to know. And what that database meant was, uh, this is how robots will talk to you, to us in the future. Um, what the database meant is I have too many of these. Uh, so you have to be, we have to ask you a question more intelligently. And so uh, Jay asked, give me at random the first 1,000. Okay. So it gave, uh, oh, the first, I think 10,000 he asked for. That's from these, these are the number of such bonds. The Cambridge database has millions and millions of CC bonds in it. So that's why it does, you don't want to know it. And so what it tells you is that the CC bond length is 1.53. When you have large numbers, it doesn't matter that some of those structures are lousy and some are good. The large number is correct for that. Or in some way, the really poor structures. If you were to see tomorrow a CC bond length of 0.4 angstroms, you know there's something wrong with the structure, uh, but so or you would uh, rule it out. But uh, it's interesting. It even gives you the uh, the um, um, non uh, quadratic nature of the potential. I mean, it, it, there's a few more longer than there are shorter in here. Uh, in this, you begin to see this asymmetry of the potential energy curve in this. Uh, you can do this for other element pairs, for instance. Here is one for iodine iodine, which is not so simple as the one for carbon carbon. Uh, when you look for iodine iodine, there is not a single peak for whatever that distance is. I'll show you what it is but there is a rather broad thing with a double peak structure. There's some lower region, yes, when things are not bonded and, uh, and yet um, there is some interaction. Uh, it's a very interesting, uh, I picked an interesting element pair for this because it's a source of a number of theoretical problems. For instance, in this database, oh yes, Yes, forgot to tell you, uh, the Cambridge database was made 
at a time when organic chemists ruled the world. Okay, therefore, they decided that the only things in our database will be organic structures. And uh, they, uh, so you have to have a C and an H to get in there. Okay, so iodine, elemental iodine is not in the Cambridge database, it's structure. So what are these II distances in the, in the Cambridge database? They correspond, well, they correspond to, for instance, triiodide, which is responsible for this peak over here. And triiodides are a very common structural motif. So how did they get into the database? Sodium triiodide is not in the database, but th they got in because they had an organic counter ion. That's the positive cation that goes with this anion. So they sort of got in by the back door. These, this is an incomplete list of, tri of triiodides. Of course, this is an interesting structural unit. It's a conceptually formative structure of something that I don't have time to tell you about, an extension of simple molecular orbital theory to electron-rich three-center bonding, either using a hydrogen or a triiodide, a p orbital uh, in a center, four electron uh, three-center bonding. Uh, that's the triiodide, but uh, a lot of the other uh, structures in here, just to, I'm not trying to hide anything. If you want to read more about this, there has been a wonderful review by Lars Klo uh, in chemical reviews of polyiodides, uh, which are interesting structures in which you get I3 minus units and other aggregates of I2, I minus, and I3 minus. Those are the main sort of components of polyiodides. Um, there is so much more one could say about structures, but I don't have the time. I do want to mention what is one of the, uh, one of the most interesting uh, papers of the last 10 years in terms of using the, um, the Cambridge Structural Database. But first I wanna show you the structure of iodine. So not, not only shouldn't you ask a theoretician what is an iodine, iodine bond, but you should look at what the structure is subject to all to various caveats about vibrations and such, which we don't have time to talk about. Uh, one thing also you should, uh, and this is behind the paper I'll show you, you should not do is ask a theoretician what a van der Waals contact is. The structures tell you what a van der Waals contact is. Uh, you can see it here. They also tell you there isn't one, there's, there's two over here. So it's about an angstrom longer for iodine. That's actually a short uh, difference between bond and van der Waals interaction. Um, but um, others are, are longer than that. But this brings me to the paper. This is Santiago's paper in Dalton Transactions called the Cartography of the Van der Waals Territories, a wonderful paper which goes in that particular case, uses all that structural information in the Cambridge Structural Database, looks at uh, interactions of metals or anything else with oxygen, but someone else can do it for other elements. Here is, for instance, a selection of two things for strontium oxygen and rhodium oxygen from the Cambridge Structural Database. These are not organic structures. They may be dative structures. They may be more ionic ones. There's clearly in each case a dative a distance for the interaction of the oxygen lone pairs with the metal, uh, strontium or rhodium, whether it's a transition metal or a more ionic one. And then there is this rapidly rising curve here, uh, which is just, <laughs> okay. So 
you draw a sphere around the strontium. And if you go four angstroms in the sphere, you'll hit some oxygens from something. They will increase as the, as the volume of that spherical shell. So that's what you're seeing over here. But then superimposed on this natural rise of distances, in every case, there is a peak. And in case you didn't believe in Van der Waals interactions, after you see this, you will never forget this. And uh, thanks to Santiago for showing this to us so clearly, but showing in another way how the Cambridge Structural Database is uh, a source of information. Oh, I come from a crystallography group. I could go on telling you about structures for a long, long time. I'm the world's greatest consumer of structures. There is, I look at them, uh, I get ideas from them. I've got to leave them. So let's talk about bond dissociation energy. So bond dissociation energy seem a very obvious measure of, um, uh, of uh, um, bonding. So we've been talking about bond length, the minimum of that curve or, or its value in the, in the uh, ground vibrational state. But now we're talking about the energy. And let's not worry about the difference between, again, vibrational state and potential energy curve, though that's something to worry about. Um, and especially for people doing reactions at, at high temperatures, for instance. So to rip apart a bond, you could, you know, you could take ethane and heat it up and look for methyl radicals where they appear. And that is one way to do it. The problem is that maybe the ethane, um, well, the problem is how to get the, the next bond that is another bond other than the first one that is ripped apart. How do you get the CH bonding energy for that? So that is mostly done indirectly today. There is a good description in this review by Allison. Uh, this is for instance, how you obtain the bond dissociation energy of a CH bond in ethane. What you do is you do two experiments, each of which can be done very precisely. The first is the photoionization of ethane, which gives, as it happens, a hydrogen atom and an electron and an ethyl cation. You can measure the threshold from the photochemistry for that happening, the energy exactly. And then the next piece of information is the addition of an electron to uh, the ethyl cation to give ethyl radical, which, uh, and, uh, but really that's the ionization potential of the ethyl radical run this way. So that can be also obtained very precisely. And then we know thermodynamics works. And so you can get, the, if you add up these two equations, you get the desired unmeasurable directly um, CH uh, bond energy. Most bond energies today are in fact obtained through these what are inherently mixtures of photo, photo uh, chemistry and mass spectrometry experiments. Bond association energies are interesting. I mean, some are pretty obvious. So a double bond is stronger than a single bond. Uh, and, and incidentally, one of the great things that one misses in the education of organic chemists or of chemists in general is thermochemistry. That is their knowledge of students in thermochemistry is deficient because people don't stress it sufficiently, but it's, it's incredibly important. And also the other thing that's happening is the creation now of conjunction of experimental and theoretical 
thermochemistry databases. So these are things that give you heat of formation of compounds, but the, they come from a system of, the, of theoretical and experimental experiments. It's a very interesting period for that. Uh, this is fairly obvious, but then you get strange things for um, like, for instance, if you run these cycles, you find out that the double bonded disilene, SiH2, SiH2, the analog of ethylene, is uh, weaker. We're talking about to rip it apart to two SiH2s, uh, than the single bond in disilane. Uh, so, silicon is always strange, uh, but the, the it's, it's very interesting why this happens and to what we should attribute this. It actually has to do something with the, with the stability of the two carbenes that are formed by ripping these apart. And it's another story we could talk about. Uh, bond association energies usually correlate with bond distances. So a shorter bond is a stronger bond, but uh, that's not always true. Uh, C2 is interesting. These are theoretical curves for C2, but by God, people should be able to calculate C2 correctly by now, and they can uh, uh, theoretically. These are some of the, here's the C2 is very interesting because it has a competition between a singlet and a trip. Uh, this is a single and this is a triplet uh, for being the ground state and separated by just a few hundred wave numbers. Uh, but what you see here uh, very clearly, well, you see here a range of bond lengths to which I will return. Uh, just to note for future reference, the range of bond lengths in the C2 molecule diatomic is, oh, what is it? 1.23 for the shortest, 1.53 for the longest. Hey, that's about the range of bond lengths in all organic molecules. Let me translate that. The C2 molecule in its ground and excited states is playing out the game of all organic chemistry. Um, and is that a surprise? <laughs> well, there's another way of saying it. I'll say it in an appalling way. In the, if you decompose the wave function for acetylene, ethylene, and ethane, you in, if you decompose it into HN and C2, the C2 state that gives you most readily the final state of acetylene, ethylene, or an ethane is not the ground state of C2, but some mixture or can be viewed as some mixture of ground state and excited state configurations of C2. Put it another way, in acetylene, ethylene, ethane, there are hiding different states of C2. So it's not, uh, it's not surprising that this is so. We'll come back. What I wanted to make is that very often this correlates with this, but not all the time. So here you see here very clearly a very interesting excited state of C2 that is shorter than the ground state, but less bound than the ground state of the C2. That's interesting. Um, the, let's talk about vibrations. So now we're talking about the, the behavior for the most molecules is roughly quadratic and there can be, this was shown a long time ago uh, as, uh, as like that of a harmonic oscillator near the minimum. There are some potential energy surfaces, of course, that get pretty far from quadratic, and those are very interesting. But where they are, you can use the force constant, the stiffness of the spring, 
for, uh, for evaluating the strength of a bond. Uh, and this is a typical vibrational spectrum. It happens to be for propanol. Nothing, I just wanted to show a vibrational spectrum. Uh, there are a number of interesting things in this, but we don't have time why this peak is so broad. Um, the thing about vibrational spectra is that they have a, a place in science which uh, most chemists uh, don't, um, don't pay much attention to, but which um, makes uh, a connection with physics and astronomy that is worth making. And that is, uh, I once made a statement in a popular science article is that there is no chemistry on the surface of the sun. Okay, what did I mean? Why did I do that? Why did I say? I said that because I knew the temperature on the surface of the sun. Let's say it was 10,000 degrees. And I knew at 10,000 degrees, no molecules could exist. They were all broken up. Well, of course, I was being stupid because it's this, the sun is not just the surface of the sun. The stuff is streaming out from the sun. And as it streams out, it cools. And it cools and molecules form. And what I wanted to show you was the incredible detail. If you look at the spectrum of anything from outer space, you can convince some a physicist that chemistry is important because you see this mess. And this mess is the vibrational rotational lines of various molecules that are formed in the outer atmosphere of, star, of stars condensed on, on pieces of dirt in interstellar space uh, and other things, incredible detail. And they are also very interested in very uh, detailed, the ast astrophysicists are very interested in great detail. And, and they're interested in this not only for stars, uh, the surface of Titan, uh, one of the best known places we have has lakes of methane and ethane at one and a half atmospheres and 90K. We, we have seen those lakes. The atmosphere of Titan has all kinds of carbon and nitrogen compounds and the infrared spectra become a direct, uh, a directly investigable thing. Anyway, what we have been a, what this is, this uh, investigation of the vibrational force constant, essentially the stiffness of the spring, which is modeling this bond has been traditionally another measure in addition to bond lengths and bond energies for uh, what is a bond. And that uh, measure can be gotten the way it was usually gotten. This is not popular science today. It's very interesting what has gone out of fashion. Here are two things that have gone out of fashion. One is, classical thermochemistry by burning compounds, combustion energies. Very few governments around the world, their aid granting agencies, support experimental uh, work on burning a new organometallic compound. You're gonna have to do this at your own expense to get the heat of formation. And yet that heat of formation is one of the most fundamental things and it'll be there forever if measured accurately. The other thing that has gone out of fashion is doing vibrational analyses in general. There are exceptions. Vibrational analyses are setting up a force field for the molecule, putting in springs. Someone makes a new molecule. In 1975, trimethylene methane iron tricarbonyl was a new molecule. It was symmetrical. The physical chemists love symmetrical molecules. So they tried to analyze the vibrations of it. So they set this up and they put different springs between the carbon and the oxygen, between the iron and the carbon. And one group put a spring between 
uh, that short distance to the central carbon and another group analyzing it omitted that spring and put in springs for bonding to the external carbons. They put in these Ks and then this is an underdetermined problem. There are fewer observables. The observables were the vibrational frequencies. The theoretical assumptions were the force constants for the springs. And what they did was they fitted the force constants to give you the best fit to the observed vibrational frequencies. That's what's called a vi or what was called a vibrational analysis. This was a very interesting situation. The molecule was symmetrical, was obviously going to attract attention. Two groups of physical chemists set about doing a vibrational analysis for trimethylene methane iron tricarbonyl. One of them was quicker than the other one. Does this sound familiar? Um, and so they, one published first. As it happened, the second group of Foyle Miller, uh, he was a remarkable physical chemist and a very honest person. It's interesting to read his paper. So what, what happens when two groups in two experimental groups in this world, or theoretical experimental, do this, what they think is the same thing, and one publishes earlier than the other. This is a bad thing for the second group that publishes. It is the best of all possible things for science. The reason is that we all know how to calculate standard deviations. That's child's play, statistical deviations and what they mean. But statistical deviations, averages, standard deviations, all that stuff has no measure of, of the kind of error which comes from using a different instrument, let's say, or even a different model of that instrument. And, and so that it's only when two groups do the same thing and it rarely happens that the later groups publish. Uh, but when they do the same thing, that you get a, a measure of the real errors in a, in a measurement, that you get an idea of how good the things are. And here, is, here is from one of those papers. These are the different kinds of vibrations that were involved. CO stretch is very, the CO stretch here is the strongest one. You see the biggest force constant here. Uh, this is the work of Foyle Miller. Uh, and this is the work of the other group and they don't, okay, so they disagree by a few percent for the CO stretch. No one is bothered by this too much, but then on some things, they even disagree on the sign and um, they, they disagree more strongly on this. This is extremely valuable, but here, Foyle Miller was a very honest scientist. And here's what he said. How significant are force constants? Two different valence force fields are now available for this. We believe that most force constants which have been derived from large symmetry blocks should be regarded with skepticism. There are several sources of uncertainty. Uh, a few of the assignments are probably wrong. Second assumptions are made. It's, it's a very good analysis. You can be certain that an Here's what I'll tell you because I, you, when you know the people, I am certain that actually Foyle Miller would have said this if he had been the first one to do the paper because that was in his character. I'm not so sure about the other group uh, that did this, but that's the way the world is. There is a triple correlation called Badger's rule, classically, between the length here the, the depth of this and the force constant over here. Three of the measures, experimental measures of the strength of a bond, but it's sometimes off. And I showed you already that it's off. There are sometimes excited states which are very, very sharp in, in their uh, very large force constant. Let's go to electron densities. So electron densities, here is 
So here is, here, here is the thinking behind this. The idea is it's, we have been calculating in theoretical chemistry, uh, the, what is, what uh, happens when you form a bond. There is some pileup of electron density in the bonding region, we think. And we are so, since Heitler London days, we've been able to calculate that. And you, you have seen, I don't have a blackboard here, the drawings of these, that the bonding density in the region of a bond is bigger than what it is uh, in the absence of that bond. So people thought they could do this experiment. Let's see how this goes. So here's a BF3 molecule. I, I want this for another reason later on. And it's a planar trigonal molecule. Here is the actual electron density of that BF3 molecule from a very good calculation as it happens to be. And what you see, it, this is in the plane on the left and in B it's along a B, in a plane that goes through a BF bond. Let's look at this one first, in the plane. Now what you see is of course there are maxima on a boron and a fluorine of electron density. And the theoretical chemist who could not help but be impressed ever since their graduate school course or Heitler London about the electron density in a bond, it's a shock at first to see this. That is the region of the BF bond. There's absolutely no doubt that there is a BF bond, whether it how much of it is dative, how much covalent you could argue about, but there is a BF bond. The region of the BF bond is along the line of the bond a minimum. And it happens to be a maximum if you go off to either side of the bond. Here it is along the B bond, goes off in two directions actually. What is happening here? So what are these peaks? These peaks are, of course, what the theoretical chemist who is so zeroed in on the bond has forgotten in that there are 1s orbitals on boron and fluorine. And those 1s orbitals, I know you want to take that density apart from the 2s, but it's experimentally hard to do. Um, and so what you see is the total electron density and these are peaks because they are uh, because of the inner cores on these things, which gives these gives them size. So okay, so what happened? Getting at the bonding electron density, what you think you you think you can defeat this, and what you can do is if you want H two. You take two hydrogen atoms, which happen to be located here, and you take from the best calculation, which today is pretty good on H2, you get the electron density, and then you subtract out the density of the atoms. So this is what I, what I meant by this way of looking at the bond. So, you, so what should you do for the atoms? Of course, the logical thing to do, you know what a hydrogen atom is, it's a spherical atom. So you subtract the spherical density and what you get is a density difference map. So these are density different maps. And uh, solid lines means, this is something which integrated over all space is zero. What, when you take the difference, uh, so there is an excess in one part, a, uh, deficit in another, there is an excess of electron density in a bond region and where it comes from is from out here and all over. Okay, you do this for H2, a bond of 104 kilocalories, let's say, and everything is okay, but then you do it for F2. And if you subtract spherical fluorine atoms, from a calculation on F2, 
you get that there is a deficit of electron density in the region of the FF bond. Uh, the FF bond is not strong, 35 kilocalories per mole, but it's a bond. And so where does the electron density come from? It comes, where is there an excess? The excess is where you, the lone pairs are. This is crazy. This doesn't match what, what we tell beginning students. Okay, this has been analyzed by Eugen Schwartz, who is one of the most reflective people in our profession, theoretician. And what he showed is that what is wrong with this reasoning is that you have subtracted uh, spherical fluorine atoms. Or one way to say this, what's wrong, is what you should have subtracted is fluorine atoms prepared for bonding. So what does that mean? Well, you could prepare them by either the electric field of the other fluorine or um, by somehow there are other ways of doing this. And so, and you have to do this preparation each time if you want the electron, difference electron density to be, um, to be of value. And so um, this, uh, so that means you have to know the answer in order to be able to do this. That's the problem that, that we've learned from Eugen. So I have, with so much work, I've only gone through here in this list. Uh, and now the other things I will just sketch for you. And I feel especially guilty uh, about uh, some of the criteria here, but let me just sketch the way that, because uh, especially because of uh, Jean-Paul Mario, who has worked with these and others in the audience about magnetic criteria. The basic, the basic idea First of all, the magnetic and the spectroscopic criteria in general have been applied to questions of weaker bonding. That is where there is, where the bond is not very strong, like the H2 case, let's say. The general idea is if you have a, a bonding orbital uh, and an antibody, these A and B are not group theoretical symbols, uh, a bonding antibonding orbital, let's say. And if you, uh, if you, if they're close to, if they're far apart in energy, there's no question that uh, the two electrons will be in the A orbital there. Uh, but if the two levels are close to each other, you have, uh, and the situation, the classic situation in inorganic chemistry has been um, that of two copper two centers in copper acetate, for instance, with water molecules bonded axially here, acetate molecules symmetrically bridging here. Uh, these are D9 systems with an unpaired electron and an X squared minus Y squared orbital along these. And do they bond to each other? This has been discussed and we've, we have measures of the interaction of those, but basically it becomes a question more generally of these two orbitals and the problem of putting four electrons in, of uh, two electrons in them. You get four, six microstates and, um, and in those are, three of them are electrons pair singlets, three form a triplet. And the usual dialogue in this field, when the interest often is in the strength of the coupling of those two, of those two electrons, but uh, in terms of the bonding, um, the, um, the question often is phrased in terms of what is the high, the um, equilibrium ground state of the molecule. And if the molecule is, if, if they are close to each other, the triplet not only has a chance, but often dominates uh, in this, the three microstates associated with this. And if the splitting is large, then 
the, one of the singlets, a configuration interaction mixing of these two usually is the ground state of the molecule. This is, ref this is reflected in the inorganic discussion of high spin, low spin. It comes up in the solid state in terms of ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic uh, ground states for the molecule. Uh, that's the, where the discussion goes. So that's, so, oh yes, so the magnetism. So, so what is the measurement? The measurement is often a measurement of the equilibrium magnetic moment done today by uh, uh, a squid magnetometer often. And uh, there are people here who have much more experience with this. The spectroscopic measure is often similar that is, it has to do with two levels, weak bonding between them, a bonding anti-bonding level. And is there more bonding as a result of some orbital interaction, either direct or through intervening orbitals? Is there less interaction, more interaction? And the terminology usually used is that of a shift of the ultraviolet transition which usually ultraviolet, which is, involves this excitation. I will not be talking any more about this because I want to finally say something about scanning tunneling microscopy and atomic force microscopy. So uh, this of course an invention of the eighties is absolutely wonderful. The idea is that you would create a, a tungsten tip which, and then there's a conducting surface on which a chemical sample might be placed. And that tip can be moved in three dimensions across the surface X, Y, and let's say Z vertically, and a current can be measured. When you jam the tip into the surface, it conducts across, you take them apart, uh, and for a substantial distance, there is a tunneling current there, which you can measure. Um, what makes this successful is exquisite control over X, Y, and Z in this. Control which is hard to imagine on an angstrom scale, but which can lead to pictures like you see here, which were from the beginning. This is of a reconstruction what, what happens if you heat up a little, a silicon one, one, one surface, a certain, cer certain cut across a silicon surface. And actually this was, it proved a suggestion that was made theoretically before. Um, this was, uh, this was so, these are really silicon atoms. And this is a range, the, Total X range here is 30 nanometers. That's 300 angstroms. Uh, amazing control over, the, over these distances. Now, uh, of course, this, uh, let me just, this was made at IBM, the discovery. It was then subjected to excessive hype. Uh, the, um, it's what happens when you combine the natural excessive hype of a company out to make money and advertise with the hype of scientists, which is usually repressed depending on their personality, but which in a time of getting, uh, of it being more or less difficult to get money for the research can increase. When you combine these two, the, the hype of scientists and the hype of companies, you get extravagant things. And in this case, what you got was advertisements which showed a picture of a bearded white gentleman and which was purported to be a picture of Democritus, okay? And there was a legend that said, now 2,500 years of waiting has been realized and we can see atoms. I mean, I went through the roof, which was very high up at the time when I saw this, uh, because uh, 
why did it, it didn't bother me that it was they did it. What bothered me was the travesty it was on 200 years of chemical evolution, where with hard work and without waiting for any microscopes to help us, without microscopes, we learned the structure of molecules, both individually in the crystal through indirect experiments, for sure, using an extension of our senses, that's our instruments, and with uh, judgment, which was good or bad, and how good those instruments did, we were able to get the structure of molecules without the help from these guys. And the point I want to make to you, because I'm still sore at them, IBM, um, not the people who did this, for, for this travesty of, of taking a miracle of human ingenuity, which is chemistry and how it got structures, and to perverting it by making it think that we were waiting for them to show us. The, therefore, I exaggerate in the upper direction, in the other directions, and I want to show you how little we've learned from STM and AFM. Okay, so that's a long story, but here's where we are today. We actually, we can see, this is a cyanine with some uh, building block of a moth, uh, and we can see this. It turns out for various reasons that silicon was the best case for seeing atoms. And it's been hard to see carbon atoms, but we can now see carbon atoms, but what, scanning tunneling microscopy gives us is something which they downplay, but which is much more interesting than the location of the atoms, which is what they sell. And that is, it gives us the shape of orbitals. It gives us the density of a molecular orbital because this voltage between the tip and the what's on the surface can be tuned positive or negative. And so we get the tunneling from filled levels in the conducting, the molecule that's made conducting by lying on a conductor, if it's not conducting itself, um, we can get the filled levels below the HOMO. And by, by tuning it the other way, we can get the density when the, the voltage comes in resonance with empty orbitals above. So we can, we're not getting psi, we're getting psi squared here. We're getting the density. And here is an example. This, uh, for, this is for pentaseed. This thing here, here is the electron density in a, in the homo of pentasy. That's pretty incredible. To, you can see, you don't need a calculation to see the nodes. You see the nodes uh, coming in here. You have to, uh, you don't have it at the resolution of two tenths of an angstrom. You have it at a resolution of well, what I would call half an angstrom. Now comes atomic force microscopy, which has become more popular lately. And in that, uh, actually, the story is a little complicated. The story looks the same, but you have seen the pictures. They're pictures like this, or sometimes they look like this. Each of these pictures is worth two articles in nature. Okay. Um, it's still the world uh, where, but this, you, you look at this and boy, it looks like pentacene. And then you begin to look at it uh, a little more carefully and there's something weird about this. First of all, there are the lit up regions at the end. So what the heck, what are they doing? What are they? You might think it's the electron density, but there's no pile up of electron density at the ends of fantasy like that. Um, it's not the electron, it's something else. The other thing you see is if you begin to, if you see, Remember those curves of, that's why I wanted to show you the BF3. The 
curves where the electron density falls off perpendicular to the bond or along the bond, these are too sharp. Okay, what I'm saying is they look too much like Kekulé textbook pictures of the molecule than what it should look like if you plot the electron density, either the bonding or the total electron density. So what they are doing, usually they do this incidentally by, they get a better picture. There's a lot of lore in this. They get a better picture by tacking on a carbon monoxide molecule, which they pick up elsewhere on the surface to the metal tip and then moving that around. Um, and you notice that they know that there's something wrong with this picture, not quite. They try to compromise the artist. You see the electron density here is about the same as the electron density here. That's not what you see here in this picture actually. Okay, so now they get marvelous things and this is really good. They can follow a chemical reaction. Here's dibromoanthracene. Notice the ends of the anthracene are lit up um, again. Dibromoanthracene, that's the bromine. And now it breaks off one bromine to give a radical, gives a di radical. This is a picture of a di radical. That's pretty incredible. And then that di radical opens up to give a seven membered ring, a chemical reaction. Absolutely amazing what we can do. So the, the reason I show you this is this is two articles in Nature in, 90, in 2015 to 20. This is Trotter's X-ray structure 1950, which gives you more information about the structure of the molecule. Um, so I really am in favor of X-ray crystallography. Um, and what's going on there is they haven't quite figured out what's going on there. But something like this is going on to make this light. First of all, what they are measuring is, and they don't tell you until you dig in the paper in the AFM, is they're measuring the repulsion of the tip for the electron density underneath. And the actual raw measurement is in the top. You'll find that in the supplementary information. So there is more repulsion when the tip is above the molecule. And then there is a massaging of the data. In, that's okay. It's, I, I can say it in a better way. But they take that electron density across and they manipulate it to get this best picture that they have. But there is something happening there where the carbon monoxide tip if it's off is falling, the question is how do they get a sharper bond than there really is in the electron density? And I think what's happening is that the carbon monoxide tip, if it goes off, if it's over the side, is somehow pulled into the bond. I don't know why. So that the region, uh, or it's pulled off to the side, the region of the bond becomes sharper focused. It has to do with the potential between that CO tip and the electron density underneath. But they need to tell us that before we get, we are not anyway at a um, hundredth, two hundredths of an angstrom resolution, which the X-ray structure has given us for 50 years. And we are still far away from it. Okay, now we are finished. We are with the first part uh, you, and you can see why this talk needs two hours. Um, I finish with this picture. I'll come back to it. We are going to take a break. Thank you. Estarem de tornada per la segona part, la teòrica en 20 minuts. Tenim el coffee break cap allà. El hall de física, sí.
So the the Raphael uh, detail of the Raphael painting of the philosophers from the stanza at the Vatican shows uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle and is uh, in some sense a good symbolism by their gestures. Uh, Aristotle, though he has been much maligned for misleading physics, actually was a very careful observer of nature. You can look in his Animalia and see that. Uh, but Plato is interested in ideal forms. And so uh, the symbolism here is of theory, let us say, on the left and experiment on the other. I find it rather amusing that even at the time of the painting of these, of the painting, he felt it necessary to not only have them each showing a book, but showing the title of the book. In the case here, Ethics for Aristotle and Timaeus for Plato. And it is, he, he wasn't sure that even the highly educated priests of his time, they were the people who were looking at this, uh, could be uh, trusted to identify the figures that you see. This is what I wanted to show you, a little bit of history. Perhaps a few of you have seen it, but uh, it comes from a paper in Proceedings National Academy of Sciences. But Niels Bohr, we know the classic paper uh, on the hydrogen atom and predicting the Rydberg series and getting it correctly uh, in 1913. The uh, atomic structure piece of the formation of the new quantum mechanics that began with Planck uh, 12 years before. Uh, this is an appendix he drafted to uh, his 1913 paper about the electronic structure of atoms and molecules. Now, the reason he knows about molecules is he had a brother uh, and I think an uncle also who, who knew about molecules. So he draws H2. Notice here methane, uh, which he, he, he knows is not square planar like Hoffman in that model. He knows it's, he's trying desperately to draw, draw its tetrahedral. He actually knows that water is not linear, but he draws it out from other things we know. <laughs> And there you see acetylene O3. It's interesting in a number of ways. You notice these X's for the electrons. You can see what he's doing. You can, you can read his mind. He's going to put two electrons into an orbit exactly halfway between the two hydrogen atoms. And he's going to vary the radius of the orbit in order to get the spectrum right. Um, one of the amusing things is that he puts the electrons uh, on opposite sides. So he knows about electron correlation. <coughs> he knows that we should put them on uh, as far away from each other. The other thing, which is absolutely incredible, is ozone. Yeah, it's interesting he knows about ozone. Again, does he know that ozone is bent 116 degrees or not? Doesn't matter. Here he has one valence structure with three electrons in each bond. Here's one with two, four. This is the first drawing of the resonance structure of ozone in the literature. And it's in this unpublished, uh, one resonance structure, unpublished work of, uh, of Bohr. This was never published in his lifetime. He never got this appendix, but someone found it. You can see the fun of being a historian of science. So, Let's talk about ways of analyzing theoretically bonds. Remembering uh, Coulson's <coughs> idea that the bond is an is a intellectual construction. I'm not going to be able to run through the myri myriad of ways of people have, but uh, some of them. So to begin with, uh, there's a verse from a, 
a song is a gift to be simple uh, from 1848. Um, uh, this was a little later, and this is the way that bonds became, uh, one began to talk about them in the times of, um, around the time when I grew up. These, these are not original to me. The only thing original in these pictures to me is uh, the lining of the orbitals. So the lining, the lining from the beginning, I, I was always interested in teaching. I was always interested in teaching in different ways. And what I'm teaching here is something which, remember that in the development of the orbital symmetry rules with Woodward, the phase of the orbitals was important. It was important whether orbitals were in phase or out of phase. And what I'm, and after we taught this to, to people and put pluses and minuses, we still got a reaction from people that plus with plus was different from minus with minus. Okay, so how to get around that, how to teach people that it's not the phase but it's the relative phase that matters, not the absolute number. So that's what lining means, uh, plus on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, it means minus. And uh, on Sundays, you can, it's e to the i5. Um, so it, this is the in-phase combination. The simplest application of perturbation theory, you can, there is nothing original about this. This is all in Coulson's book. And before then, it's very interesting to trace where for the first time these interaction diagrams appear. In everyday use, they appear probably in a Walsh papers in the 50s, but Coulson is responsible, I think, for them, though they appear in other ways. So if two orbitals mix, uh, the lower one mixes into itself the upper one in a bonding way, and the upper one mixes into itself the lower one in an anti-bonding way. And the important thing here is the syn syn synonymity of two things that are obvious, and a third thing that uh, the at least the chemists who first saw this did not see as obvious. The two things that are obvious is Delocalization is the same thing as bonding. Um, the thing that's not obvious is that it always implies, almost always, implies electron transfer. So those are the two things. So this orbital here is it was localized on the left. It's now delocalized. This one's delocalized the other way. Uh, mixing means uh, delocalization. Uh, whether it has consequences or not depends on how many electrons there are. So we'll see in a moment. But the other thing is charge transfer. I mean, this is all on the left side of the molecule. The, the molecular orbitals, both on the left or the right. Uh, since that time, people have been arguing for 60, 70 years how we measure the amount of electron transfer, but that there is some partial electron transfer is obvious in this picture. So this is the simplest perturbation theory. Uh, you, I could give it a formal name of non-degenerate uh, second order mixing here. Um, how many, uh, whether you get stabilization or destabilization depends on whether you have two electrons or if you have four. If you have four, you get, uh, as a first approximation, you get nothing. But actually, if you look at in detail with including the overlap, you get a repulsion. Okay, so this is four electron two, uh, four electron two orbital repulsion to be subsequently renamed a little bit later as Pauli repulsion. Uh, but really, it's there in the beginning. So these were the things, and now, now we come to diatomic molecules. So this you will find also in, in Coulson, in Irene Walter, in Kimball, in 
Pullman and Pullman in Silkin's book, Russian. And uh, these things are in all the books, uh, diatomic molecules. Probably they go back to Hans Hellmann in his German first quantum chemistry book in my, the, written in the year, published in the year I was born, 1937. So where are we today? Well, around high school, we still teach this picture. Um, and that is what we are doing formally, we're, what we are doing is, uh, is zeroth order the degenerate perturbation theory, but doesn't matter what we call it. The S orbitals of a diatomic molecule, let's say this is N2 formation interact to give a bonding antibody combination. The P orbitals give a, a sigma and sigma star, a pi and pi star. Uh, there are group theoretical labels you can attach or not. Um, and those of you who know the orbital symmetry story know that in the level diagrams and the correlation diagrams, we, Woodward and I did not use the proper group theoretical labels, which, which Longett Higgins and Abrahamson didn't everybody. We used S's and A's. There was a reason for that. Didn't want to scare the organic chemists. It's very simple. We used S's and A's, which they understood as symmetric anthrax. Symmetric, um, it, a pedagogical reason behind. Anyway, this orbital, the first kind of account from Hellman's book on uh, of getting the bond order. Okay, so what's a bond order? Some measure of the strength of the bonding, which will relate to the experimental measures in some way. So that uh, this was a, a one bond. This was an antibonding orbital. This was a bonding orbital. This is a bonding orbital. So if you fill, if you fill um, in helium to both this and this, then you have no net bond. You fill then usually people don't talk much about lithium two. Oh, we, we could uh, beryllium two, boron two, um, uh, and uh, N two fills through here and it fills a bond and then two more for a pi bond. And at this point, everything is okay. And also it makes a correspondence to the triple bond that the organic chemists had been drawing for 60 years prior to that from 1870 till 1930 for that. Um, okay, so that is, so that's a simple bonding, bond order uh, one for the two electrons, zero if you fill four, and then three if you fill through here for nitrogen. All right, this is what we still tell high school students in general, uh, secondary school. But now we come to graduate school, uh, or at least to, uh, uh, in Europe, it would happen earlier, around the second or third course in the university if they are chemistry students. Uh, don't worry, physics students will never see this. My daughter has a PhD in physics and I can tell you that she, she has never seen this thing. Uh, she is very good at what she does in climate change, but this is part of a chemistry construction. Um, if the physicists get to the helium atom, they, you, they count themselves lucky. Okay, so here is now the complication of this figure, picture. When you can tell somebody about something beyond second order non-degenerate perturbation theory, or zeroth order degenerate perturbation theory. So you have done the zeroth order here, but of course, as was known to Hellman from the beginning, this is the beginning of the work. And what happens after this, viewed from a perturbation theory perspective, is uh, that you mix, you take these proper symmetry adapted orbitals, and here's a sigma G, 
and here is a sigma g, and here is a sigma u, that's the second one, and there is a sigma u up there. And one of the rules of perturbation theory, uh, which I like, is absolute miscegenation. That is, if anything can mix, it will. Question is only how much, that's all. But they'll mix, so these two will mix with each other. And now comes a very interesting learning point. That is, this mixes with that to give this orbital here and this one over here. And now there comes a, a terrible danger lurking for the beginning student. And that is that when they mix these, they want to have the two mixtures come out looking exactly the same. And they've forgotten another rule of perturbation theory, that is, if this mixes with that, first of all, they'll repel each other. That's one of the rules of perturbation theory. Uh, but the other one is if the lower one becomes more bonding by mixing in P character here, so as to form a better bond here, the upper one cannot become more bonding. It must become less bonding because it goes up. And that is a lesson. Uh, this is, there was once a, a program on radio, uh, uh, Garrison Keeler used to talk about uh, a, a certain uh, mythical place where all the children were better than average. Okay, that's about the same. Uh, that is, all levels are lower than what you started with. It, doesn't happen in a normal world. And uh, this level goes up. And in fact, it, this has physical consequences. In N2, the homo is not the pi u. It is a two sigma g. It, it, the, that is over there in this labeling system. So that, that orbital is pushed up above and it'll have consequences above it. Anyway, this picture, which is no more than the application of perturbation theory at a slightly higher level than before, is what leads you to two interesting things. One is that leads you to now a little more refined picture of the bonding. Yes, this was a bond, this was an antibond. But this is a bond and this is, looks more like a non-bonding orbital. And this one still remains that bond that is over here, the pi bond, but that level becomes a non-bonding orbital. So actually you get a picture closer to the chemist who draws two lone pairs and a pipe and a triple bond. And now you can see them, but now you no longer can assign a bond order one minus one you get here something positive, a number here, you get a number, that, but it's not one or two. Uh, it's something small, say it's uh, 0.9, this one, or maybe it is more than that. This one becomes smaller than minus one, it's minus 0.3. So the world becomes more complicated. This is, of course, the, the lesson of life and not just the perturbation theory. Um, the simple, the simple, simple worlds are for simple minds and uh, the world is, is what it is. And this, and now you have, so here's what Mulliken invented in the population analysis. If you have a wave function extends over two centers, the wave function should be normalized say the individual functions are normalized there and to go over all spaces one. So you get C1 squared times uh, M plus C2 squared, and then you get two C1, C2 for the overlap. And so Mulliken, this is a Mulliken population analysis. He devised around 1950. And it's pretty obvious that you want this, this, this is in some way representative as a measure of bonding. Um, it, it's interesting that it has both C1 and C2, but it has S12 in it, 
which most chemists actually forget about, uh, which is important. So, but right away here, this is where you can teach organic chemists that plus times plus is the same as minus times minus. That is, you still have a bond, whether it's two between two negative lobes or between two positive lobes. Okay, the S12 is, sorry, the S12 is important there because this is what allows you to say that there is no bond, or it's one of the things which allows you to say there's no bond between the 1s orbitals on nitrogen molecule. Yes, you form the molecular orbitals just like you did for the 2s orbitals. Uh, C1, phi1 plus C2, phi2. And these coefficients are 1 over square root of 2. But the S12 between two 1s functions on some neighboring carbons is tiny. So it, there is no contribution to a bond order of that. There are other ways by transforming to localized orbitals. Anyway, these are the conditions for getting a large bond. Now, uh, you see here what's coming. This is the Mulliken population. Since that time, uh, we have had a number of other bond indices. Perhaps this is a way to call them. Um, bond, not bond orders, bond indices. They are attached to various names, Levdeen, Weiberg, Mayer. Each has, there's a calculational method they go with. Uh, the the uh, values are not uh, integer values. We have lost that, but we've gotten used to. There is a correlation between bond order and the various strengths of the bonds. So there are other measures. Um, there also are, uh, this looks like it should be associated with center one, this associated with center two, but should you use these as measures of ionicity? Uh, there are problems with all of these. Okay, that's the simple picture. It's actually the world in which I moved and made a living and was able to explain uh, lots of things. Um, I will come back to it, but I want to talk about the other measures of bonding. So one of them is uh, Richard Bader's. It is too bad that Richard is no longer with us. Uh, he, of course, would be incensed by whatever I said, but then he, he was incensed by whatever anyone else said uh, about those things, but it was fun to have him around. Uh, at meetings uh, to talk about things. Bader's idea, Bader started out as an organic chemist, uh, but very quickly became a physical chemist. And he had, he had some very good ideas, which he expressed in a number of places, including a book. At some point he came to the idea of a, of a bond path. And so this is where I return to that BF3, which I showed you, remember the density here, a minimum along the direction of the bond, actually, despite every chemist wanting it to be a maximum, it's a minimum. And in a perpendicular direction, in two perpendicular directions, uh, here is, uh, it's actually a, a, a maximum. So, he, and he also showed a theorem which people knew, but he popularized it. Here's the electron density actually pl plotted out. And here, he, here are uh, gradient vectors, the derivatives uh, of the electron density for BF3, for instance, like this. He showed that all the trajectories traced out by the gradient vectors terminated the nucleus the results of surface called atoms and molecules. We'll see those surfaces in just a moment. And then he, just to get to the definition, uh, he defined um, the 
along a line between two fluorines, this point, a bond path, as a line of maximum density, which was actually maximum in two dimensions, but a minimum in the third dimension, the line of maximum density linking the nuclei. This point was the bond critical point. This was the bond path. Now, the interesting thing that happened after Vader got this is, after got, Vader got this formalism, was X-ray diffraction in the hands of a few people became so precise. An example is Phil Coppins, whose name is here, that you could get experimental X-ray density maps. And here is one that Coppins produced for methyl carbamide, that molecule over there. So what you see here, let me just get you the where we are. The red are contours of the density. The blue are the gradients of the density. Um, the density of uh, most molecules is uninteresting that remember that plot it has a big plot big center and any heavy atom if you have transition metals they're still bigger because the cores contribute to that density mainly but you can see it here oxygen nitrogen hydrogen has some it's hard to see what was the hydrogen here anyway they trace out these are the black lines here are the experimental zero flux serve, the, the experimental boundaries of the basins. And now these basins, which you can define as regions and in which you can actually integrate on the total electron density in there and there. First of all, the thing you see, of course, is if the basin if the if the atom is on the outside of the molecule the basin will extend to infinity but of course it falls off exponentially so there isn't much electron density out out there uh, in the hydrogen or even out there for the oxygen but this are the the bond crit the critical paths are the dark lines and you see here how the bond critical paths trace the Kekulé structure of the molecule. They don't tell you what's a double bond or single bond, but it, they tell you what's bonded to something else. So it looked for a while and Bader was pushing very hard for this being the bond critical point, being the defining feature of a bond and I, I found it interesting that we, one could get that experimentally. Very soon, and even in Bader's papers, there were problems. The problem in Bader's papers came for helium-2. That is, when he did a critical analysis for helium-2, he found a bond critical path between the two helium atoms. Okay, but here it is, it came up first in things like phenanthrene and biphenyl here. So the bond critical points are the little red dots here. You see a bond critical point in the middle of each CC bond. And also everywhere that any chemist thinks there is a bond, there is a bond critical point. Looks good, except there is a bond critical point between the two hydrogen atoms there and between the two hydrogen atoms in what organic chemists call the bay position of phenanthrene. And every organic chemist knew for 50 years at that point that those positions are sterically hindered. What did they mean when they said that it was sterically hindered? What they meant was that the at any atom substitute in those positions get in trouble with each other, repel each other, anything you want to say, 
How do you know? First of all, it's difficult to make them. You cannot make the thing with two T butyls in those two positions, but you can make the thing with two methyls. But the two methyls try to get out of each other's way. It's so visible. You look at the structure, they, they bend above and below. And the real killing point came in when, when one did, for instance, a beta analysis of something like a helium atom trapped in fullerene. So how do you trap a helium atom in fullerene? You take fullerene, which is stable to a thousand C, pretty incredible for a molecule that's thermodynamically unstable uh, relative to carbon and H2. Um, you heat it to a thousand C, the, the molecule is going crazy, vibrating, opens up a hole, helium, you heat it in an atmosphere of helium, a helium atom once in a while goes in, the molecule closes up. Once it's trapped inside, all you do is take a mass spectrum. And you've got a mass spectrum for 720 plus four for the helium atom. So you, 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 can, um, you, you can figure this out. When you do the analysis, you see what you get. You get normal bond critical points uh, at, at, at every five membered ring, at every six membered ring at the midpoints, and then radiating out from the central helium atom toward the 60 carbons are 60 bond critical lines and six, uh, centered by bond critical points. Anyone who is going to tell an organic chemist that there are 60 helium carbon bonds is, is not going to be believed. So this has trouble. So what it is, it's a descriptor of topology. The simplest example, if you ever wanna work through it, is helium two, in fact, which was in Bader's book. That is, you get a bond critical point there. Now you can still save something. And that is by taking the next derivative of the density. And then what you get is this equation, you get a kinetic and a potential energies, and you can look uh, at the Laplacian when it is substantially negative one has a pretty normal bond. When, when it's positive, you have helium two or the positions. The real trouble Bader and other people got in is in trying after they found the bond critical point between the sterically hindered position in phenanthrene, they manufactured a theory in order to give an attractive interaction between those. That was they didn't let go and that was their problem uh, in the end. So uh, one, there are other measures that you can have which are of this general. I don't wanna, I'll come back just in general conclusion about uh, Bond, about this. You can see that Richard would be very unhappy with this if he were here, so I'm not being fair to him. Electron localization function made by introduced by Beck and Edgecombe now over 30 years ago. This was a more physics-based thing, but, but uh, in part, but also had a, a, a certain chemical idea behind it, which goes back to the beginnings of quantum mechanics. The general idea was, let us look for regions of space where there is a large probability of finding electrons of opposite spin to each other. So let's outline quickly what are such regions that we know from other experience. One is bonds, that was the reason to look for it. The other one is lone pairs, and the third one is inner cores, like uh, the one as orbitals on carbon. The electron interaction with the nucleus is large enough to overcome the repulsion for the each other. Okay, so they, it turns out that it's difficult for reasons I don't want to explain to find out regions of large probability of electrons of opposite spin. It turns out it's easier to find regions of large probability of electrons of the same spin. And so they, uh, one of their assumptions of this method is that uh, those regions 
where there is a large probability of, where there is a low probability of electrons of the same spin will be the regions where there's a large probability of electrons of opposite spin. So there's an anti-correlation. So they defined an L function. This is a maneuver in order to, it's an inverse. So this is the maneuver for converting large to small. This F of R turns out that the first, that the density and the, the probability function and the curvature are zero. You have to go to the second derivative, so not the curvature. You have to go to the second derivative uh, of the pair probability function. Uh, this is just one definition of, that they gave of the ELF, which I found uh, reasonable to think about physically, is they, um, they looked for the large areas of curvature, and then this one over one plus F is just to make it come out between zero and one. That's all. Okay, so now what we have, the general conclusion is high F, high probability of electrons of the same spin means low probability of electrons of opposite spin and vice versa. Okay, so the problem with this definition as they gave it is if I were doing it, since I'm always interested in teaching, the first thing I would do is to apply it to normal molecules, but they didn't, okay. So they weren't interested in those, but other people did immediately. Burdett and McCormick had a, had a, um, had a paper on this. And here is, uh, here is uh, uh, water, here is ammonia. These are ELF maps, one contour of ELF. You have to specify a contour. Here is one for cyclohexane. This is cyclopropane, this is acetylate. So, the, so now, does it, these are also ones that don't show the inner core ELF, which is high for the 1S orbitals, but you see here the lone pair, and you see here two lone pairs in water. It's, it's coming out the way it should, sort of. Uh, cyclohexane is interesting. Uh, well, I didn't tell you about the two hydrogens in water, uh, but the two hydrogens in water, the three hydrogens in ammonia, all of the hydrogens in organic molecules, when you look at ELF, what you find is a basin of large ELF, which reaches out beyond the hydrogens. It's somehow, I mean, people, organic chemists know that CH bonds are localized and they're strong but it doesn't, those balloons here for the C, for the NH, OH, or CH don't quite look, they look too big. They look like balloons. But here, cyclohexane is interesting. You see the little green circles? Those are the CC bond ELF regions. Very nice. Um, we had to do this. Why? If I were, well, I'm not gonna say. I mean, we had to calculate. This is cyclopropane, it's very nice. Not only do you see the CHs and the CCs, but you see the bent bonds of cyclopropane. The ELF region is outside of the line between the two nuclei. Nice. Acetylene is a little stranger. These are the core ELF regions for the carbons. These are the CH balloons, which we sort of get used to from that. And this is very interesting. This is a toroid for the two pi bonds in acetylene. And the CC sigma bond at this contour does not show up. But if I go to another contour, it'll, it'll show up. It has some, it has some relationship which I think is useful. Uh, there is another thing that's been introduced called electron localizability indicator. Um, it's not that different. Here is an LA acetylene here, you see the core region, the torus for the pi bond and the weird large um, CH regions. Uh, 
of the molecule. Okay, so now let's talk about ELF and quantum theory of atoms and molecules. Should we believe this theory? So I, I've written about this uh, in why, an article called Why Buy That Theory. The theory of theories goes as always that one theories uh, explain, an interesting word, allow one to understand of what is known. You don't expect the theory to explain everything under the sun, but you expect, ex expect it to blend with other theories at the fringes. And it makes some sort of verifiable predictions, uh, preferably risky. Risky was like predicting the advancement of the perihelion of Mercury. Uh, by Einstein, um, things that you don't expect. Um, there are other reasons why people buy theories. One of the most dangerous one for a scientist, and I have a major disagreement here with a number of people in physics, uh, is aesthetic reasons. And that is, theory should be believed because the equations are beautiful. Okay, that's... Uh, so this is my, um, the, uh, and what it is to me is a, a failure by human beings, especially in a kind of level of complexity. It may be so at some elementary level, but at the level of evolution and complexity that we live, where the aroma of a good, of a good Spanish wine we can identify 3,000 molecules in it. It's not because the wine is impure, it's because the wine is good and it is the product of evolution. Um, I think to attribute simplicity to anything is, is foolhardy. It's, it's, it's just what human beings do. Um, and, uh, but it is uh, behind aesthetic reasons. Another reason we uh, believe certain theories is they tell a good story or a good story is told in telling it. This is also dangerous, but it's a little less dangerous because storytelling is actually very deeply ingrained in humanity. Uh, I think for instance, that Darwin's theory of evolution for a long time of its acceptance from Darwin and Wallace on until modern times was because it told a damn good story uh, and the greatest story of them all. And uh, eventually we got some proofs, but it was some time coming. This is something controversial. Evelyn Fox Keller, I don't have it here has written a book about this, about biologists especially. Uh, what, this has, what, this, uh, what this says is that the social needs of the community and the prejudices of its members are put into acceptance of theories. Ah, let me put it this way. Uh, if you looked in 1700, the wonderful members of the Académie Française, the, the Real Sociedad, uh, uh, the National Academy of Science didn't exist, the Royal Society. If you ask them, could Africans, Blacks, Asians, and Jews be scientists, they would tell you, no way. Okay, where did that come from? Came from, came from their prejudices, it's a social, needs of their society. How many such prejudices we still accept to this day? I did leave out women too. We're in that list of excluded. Portable productive. Portable, this is very hard for theoreticians to accept. A portable theory is one you can give away that someone else, like a valise, takes over and uses. And theory, and that you must not, you must not go back to the originator of the theory in order to use it. If you think about it, the orbital symmetry rules were in that category. And that was part of the reason they caught on. Productive just means uh, that 
the theory suggests experiments. So it's giving primacy to experiment. Um, productive in terms of suggesting experiments. There are theories which are very interesting but suggest no experiments. Um, okay, my personal feeling is quantum theory of atoms and molecules is very analytical and descriptive, but it is it fails on being predictive and productive. I have not seen a single molecule predicted except wrong ones uh, from, from the quantum theory of atoms and molecules. It's an interesting way of analysis. ELF is a little bit back better and the work of Yuri Grin, uh, just retiring from Max Planck Institute for Solid State Chemistry um, about lone pairs and inorganic compounds is I find very useful. I don't have time, I don't want to take the time to tell you much about natural bond orbital analysis. This is a theory of bonding though, uh, that mainly Frank Weinhold, who um, working together with Clark Landis lately has introduced, it's, it's, it's actually an interesting theory because I was in on its beginnings when Frank was listening to, to, uh, to uh, Perol of Levdin talk about natural orbitals. And then I saw him implement this, uh, but it's a theory of some complication, but motivated by good chemistry at the end. I worry a little about too much of that motivation being built in. There are a number of matrix diagnosations, eigenvalue problems along the way to go from a density operator to natural orbitals and eventually to orbitals that look very much like the orbitals that chemists think of. For instance, uh, uh, Frank uh, and his coworkers can produce a hybrid on a nitrogen uh, that's over here, interacting with a hybrid on a carbon to give a CN sigma bond, anti-bond. Uh, there is a population analysis. Most interesting, um, there are charges that come out. The charges seem to me somewhat exaggerated, but that's maybe a prejudice on my kind. Uh, there is a perturbation theory attached, which is part of it is very good. It's a, a perturbation theory, which tells you which orbitals of one piece, here it's easy, a hybrid on nitrogen, a hybrid on carbon. Uh, what is the interaction of two orbitals? Is it big or is it large? The perturbation theory lacks a repulsive part and uh, in general, and that is a bit of its, of its problem. Then there is the energy decomposition analysis coming out of a, of a age old dream. People who do it, don't say it that way, but as externally, the age old dream is my God, there are atoms and molecules. So we're going to form the molecule by putting it together from the atoms. Okay, so in some ways that's the dream of all of these, but uh, Morokuma and Rauch and Siegler implemented it the ADF programs, the theory behind it of Behrens and Bickelhaupt made it possible and Franking uh, is popularized this method. So again, I don't have time to, to analyze this, but I suspect actually that many people know about it. So what you do is you take two fragments, let us say, two methyl groups to form ethane. You, the first thing you do is you look at the electrostatic interaction of the two fragments with each other, calculated classically. And then what you do is you form, at that point, the wave functions are not anti-symmetrized there's nothing done to the wave functions of the fragments, just the electrostatics. It's interesting what it is. It's usually attractive, usually attractive. 
Then you put in the next part, which is uh, what's called putting in the poly repulsion. You form the pro proper anti-symmetrized uh, combinations. Now, actually, what's going into that are two things. One is that I said proper anti-symmetrized combinations, and those are the same ones that you'd put into a simple Fickle-like theory by just putting in the overlap in the calculations. So that, in, and this is where instead of the two levels splitting symmetrically in a perturbation theory sense, they split asymmetrically, that the upper one goes down. And this is the result of what in a simple theory is called a four electro repulsion. But here, uh, they have termed it the poly repulsion. Um, it somehow sold better as the poly repulsion. Okay, so now, and then finally, uh, up to this point, you have not allowed any interaction of the orbitals. Now you allow interaction, and that interaction has the interaction of the main contributors, of course, are filled orbitals of one piece with unfilled orbitals of the other. Uh, the, um, oops, I forgot to, uh, to look at this. Uh, here is, for instance, from a Franking paper, a result of building up ethane, ethylene, acetylene from fragments CH3, CH2, CH. And this is the calculated energy of interaction. The units here, I do believe, are in kilo. Ah, they're, I'm not sure what they are. They're in kilocalories uh, because the dissociation energies are here 83 for the single bond, double bond, triple bond. And they, um, the interaction energy is negative. It's made up of this four stage thing, an electrostatic term that's negative, a poly repulsion that's always positive, and then an orbital interaction that's also almost always negative. And then they add up the, and the orbital interaction, you can partition into sigma and pi. And to nobody's surprise, you find that most of the bonding in ethane is sigma and very little pi. Uh, but you get some pi component here and you get more component over here. Oh, there are some other terms. In the end, what I have found, I have looked at hundreds of these and in every case of chemical significance, I know the total energy of interaction of fragments, unless they're really weird, goes as the orbital interaction. Now, I'm prejudiced to see that. So you may, uh, Franking will quarrel with me, but just like this increases, this is a real calculated energy, too many significant figures. Uh, for ethane, ethylene, acetylene. These are the orbital interaction energies and they're much bigger and they're going to be reduced by the poly repulsion. But they uh, are uh, very much like the orbitals. I don't see that you've gained very much uh, beyond the orbitals. Okay, I could go on with other things. It gets very boring to see the various ingenious, boring, but I'm, these are ingenious ways that people have come up. So I want, I've told you what I think of these. I think these other ones are much more informative and productive. I didn't say that, but I will say it now. But now I want to, I don't want to stop here. I want to give um, a some advertising for the first way, which is just she, seeing the molecular orbitals. 
because this is this looks to be the situation. So it it looks like it's it looks like it's hopeless. There are here where these people arguing about benzene 60 years ago, and there they are arguing again. And this doesn't include things which are, but you can see it in the literature, and you can uh, you can also understand a little bit the dissatisfaction of the person who is into artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning and things like that with the continuing discussions. You can also see from another perspective, a physicist looking at this and saying, oh, you're just a bunch of chemists. You don't know how to define things. And I'm going to define you. Uh, I'm going to define for you when there is a bond, when there isn't a bond. And in some ways that was behind the introduction as it should be. But you see these questions, hydrogen bonding, Sigma holes, uh, popular invention, the, but even as a rotation barrier and we participated in discussion on inverted ligand fields, people are arguing to this day about bonding concepts. And a lot of people get discouraged by this. So I'm here to do two things from my perspective. One is to tell you that there is a lot still in a simple view. And the second is just don't worry so much. Um, in, in some sense, this is a reflection of the complexity of science. But let me tell you about the simple things, why I think that we should not forget the simple things in an age where we can do all of these other things. So here is C2, but now many of you know the lengthy discussion uh, of people fighting it out, or is there a quadruple bond in C2? That's not what I want to talk about. I, I think it's interesting, incidentally, the quadruple bond in C2 was written down by, Mo, by Pauling, uh, sorry, by Mulliken in a paper in 1939. Um, so there's nothing new about this, so he didn't argue about it. Now I'm interested in the spirit of getting a theory that's portable and productive. I'm not interested in knowing that much whether C4 has a quadruple bond or not. I'm interested in what I can tell an experimentalist to do to change it. Or what kind of tools can I give an experimentalist to modify it? Because I think that's very chemical. So I begin here and C2 in its ground state has a bond length of 1.2425. It happens to be a little longer than a settler. Okay. I'm not going to tell you the force constant. I'm not going to tell you the bond energy, but it's pretty high. Uh, someone here will remember. But what interests me are these curves. And again, I'm believing here actually what is now an old theoretical calculation. Uh, and that there are some that are shorter and there are some that are longer. And there are some with double minima. That's interesting too, uh, which is something spectroscopists have known for some time. Very interesting consequence. People have assigned different spectroscopic states to these. This is the, if you look in Hertzberg's book, on diatomic molecules, that's the late 30s. People knew 13 excited states of C2. And today we have 17 that we know things about. It's an experiment for your students in a physical chemistry course to figure out from the rotational spectrum, the moment of inertia of the molecule and from that, the bond lengths in the molecule. Okay. now I. I prepared for this by sh showing you this. Uh, and 
what I really want. So you remember, oh, let me just tell the story briefly. High school, university, life is more complicated. Orbitals get hybridized. I forgot to say this. So in, you remember the difference between, this is now in teaching to high school, difference between hybridization. Where does hybridization, here's the question. Where does hybridization come in in molecular orbital theory? It comes in, in right at the beginning in Pauling's picture by forming hybrids. So actually, if you look in the original papers, it's very interesting how he does it. But in molecular orbital theory, there is no hybridization at this stage. Hybridization comes in when you apply second order perturbation theory in a perturbation framework. It's when S orbitals, when P orbitals on a given center can mix with S orbitals on the same center. That will not happen in zeroth order because those two orbitals are orthogonal on the same center. It only happens because this orbital here has an overlap with that orbital here, which has an overlap with that. If I were to write this out in perturbation theory, it's an HIJ, HJK that gives that mixing. Uh, and here I've done the perturbation theory sequentially. I've here mixed these two, and now I mix this with that. Anyway, it's just teaching things. That's the that's my picture. Now, this is a theoretical assignment, but it was done still by Mulliken and by Hertzberg. So now comes another story. Who believed Mulliken in the early days? And it was implicit in what I just said, Mulliken and Hertzberg. So Mulliken came from spectroscopy. And though Mulliken reached out to chemists by looking especially at charge transfer complexes and at hyperconjugation, if you look at it historically, the main community with which, which Mulliken convinced of the utility of molecular orbital theory, not only Mulliken, but Mulliken and Hund, who is a forgotten name in this story. Mulliken and Hund convinced the spectroscopy community. This is why Gerhard Herzberg is very important and his book on diatomic molecules. He convinced them that using simple molecular orbitals, you could make sense of the strength of bond in molecules, of the shape of molecules too. And so that the ground state of C2 has, remember C2, nitrogen will occupy through here, 10 valence electrons. C2 has two electrons less. What's going to be vacated? Hey, you can see right away where the triplet that is competing for the ground state. The, triplet pi u, it comes from, it comes from one electron here and one electron here. Those two levels are close to each other. They're the, the ground state is occupied through here, two electrons in sigma u, four electrons in pi u. The first excited multiplet comes from promoting an electron here. Is the bond length in the first excited state going to be shorter or longer than in the ground state? I'm asking an introductory chemistry course question, which you can use on your next exam for the students. If I'm going to promote from a pi orbital that's very bonding to an orbital that's non-bonding, I'm going to lengthen the bond. And sure enough, it comes up 131. I'm telling you, Mulliken said this in 1939, and Hertzberg saw it, and he repeated, and he believed it. Okay, so how do you get very long bonds? Here's one with very long bonds. 
here is the one, sorry, here is one with a long bond. You get a molecule with a long bond by occupying an antibonding orbital. It turns out that you, uh, that you get it over here and it's this orbital here. Whoops, we forgot what that orbital was like. It's that one here. That orbital really lengthens the bond if you put an electron in. So when you promote from here to here, you lengthen the bond a lot. And that's how you get 1.53. Okay. How do you make a bond shorter than the ground state of the molecule? Now, something I'd like you to think about is where else in chemistry do you know a situation where the excited state of a molecule has a stronger bond than the ground state of the molecule? So organic chemists actually know one case. I'm, not, I'm just going to tell you what it is. It's the central bond of butadiene. If you butadiene, and you can get it from the MOs very quickly. The central bond of butadiene, if you do a pi to pi star excitation, actually shortens the central bond, but it lengthens the side bond. And that shows up in the photochemistry of butadiene. Anyway, a short bond here, here is a short bond. And what you get, so in words, what you need in order to get a short bond, shorter than the ground state, is you need that you, ex if you believe in orbitals, I do, <laughs> obviously, um, that's part of my story here. Um, what you need to do is to promote from anti-bonding to bonding, if you want shorter. Okay, so what, I, what I'm going to do is to take an electron out of here and put it into here. This is not very anti-bonding, a little, but enough to shorten it a little. And that's, that's exactly the configuration um, that one wants. Okay. That was C2 in spectroscopy. You notice here, not a word about quadruple bonding. We can talk about it that if you want, but, but I'm interested in a wider range of chemistry because it has been my fortune or my luck to, to work on very inorganic molecules and not just organometallic molecules, but here is a group of carbides. They are almost all the work of Wolfgang Giajko who's just retired at, uh, where was he? I'm losing the name of the place, but he, the one that you know from, from a beginning in which was once the formation of a industry is carbide, calcium carbide. Everyone, everyone a hundred years old would remember a carbide lamp, but everyone, to, no one today knows a carbide lamp. A carbide lamp is a, a lamp where you put calcium carbide and you light it and it gives a flame. The flame is calcium carbide hydrolyzes water and hydrolyzes with water to give acetylene, which burns. Um, calcium carbide is an ionic compound in which there is a simple cubic structure of calcium two plus with C2 two minus. And as you uh, get from this ionic structure, uh, this has uh, a C2, two minus is isoelectronic with acetylene. It has a bond length of actually 1.19, not that different from acetylene. What, um, what Yaichko has made is a series of compounds here. And he, now he was working in the, air, in the, in the age of the X-ray structure. The first thing that Wolfgang Yajko did was to do a crystal structure of this. And he did these, these are compounds which we under no circumstances will tell first year students about. I mean, what are we to make 
about erbium-10, ruthenium-10, C19. The thing refuses to go away despite our mind's wish for simplicity. Uh, and it's there, he made it. And it has in it C2 units, and the C2 units have a bond length, which varies 1.38. In fact, here are some of the simpler ones because I can show them. This prosium cobalt carbide, uh, what can we do here? I mean, we can put this prosium three plus, we can put cobalt two plus or three plus, maybe C2. Maybe we, that's not too good. It puts too much negative charge in this. Um, anyway, the structure is if I were talking to, it depends who I talk to about the structure. If I talking to organometallic chemists, I would say what we have is layers of dysprosium and cobalt carbon. That's, that's a real fact. There are real layers. The dysprosium, the, here is the cobalt carbide la layer in red and in blue. And if I were to describe this to organometallic chemists, I would say it's a two-dimensional structure with a Cobalt, di, uh, cobalt pi bonded to a C2 and di sigma bonded. That's what it is. Um, wouldn't it be fun to make a two dimensional polymer of the composition cobalt C2, three minus? Uh, we don't know. So this is one of the things that you will see in the next years. We are going to learn how to solubilize. It's just a way of talking about it. We're going to learn, we have the beginnings in some of the, uh, super, uh, some of the research on, on, in organic. We're going to learn how to, what is this? This is, let me talk about this in elementary chemistry. This is a dysprosium ion acting as a Lewis acid toward a cobalt carbide layer that's very interesting. I'd love to have an organometallic polymer that would be of that stoichiometry. What's happening here is the dysprosium three plus is a very good counter ion to the cobalt C2 layer. And what if I'm a chemist, what I need to find is to find a cation, which is a better Lewis acid this is just a way of talking toward this Lewis base layer, but a way of talking which ties to synthetic inorganic solid state chemistry in this case. Fascinating things. Anyway, the C2 has 1.37 in here, an interesting intermediate. Okay, now, how am I gonna explain these things? How am I gonna explain all of these molecules? You know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a theoretical analysis and I don't know what the charge is on the C2 over here, unit in this molecule, which has things. But what I'm gonna look is at the population of these various orbitals in here. And I will try to get to see if it makes sense, the distance in terms of that population. I have a tool, I have a handle for handling change. I don't wanna lose that. I don't wanna lose it in two ways. I don't wanna lose it in the age of computational chemistry where you can do that calculation. I don't wanna lose it in the age of machine learning where, uh, where you could put this in together with other, with the other 1,300,000 structures in the various databases. Here is my C2 wheel. These C2s, uh, this is a uh, diatomic molecule in a gas phase. This is organic chemistry. This is an organometallic compound my colleague, um, Pete Wolzanski has made where he has his favorite uh, tantalum um, silicate ligand in here, bonding to an acetylene. He's a C2 bonded to two ruthenians. 
Here is encapsulated into a cobalt and nickel cage. Here is the calcium carbide structure. This is uh, this is some complicated carbide, but you can see the C2 units. This is what happens when you put acetylene on a silver 110 surface. It strips off the two hydrogens and you get C2 units. I think nature's trying to send me a message. The message is, I don't care if you guys call yourself organic chemists, uh, in or organometallic chemists, inorganic chemists, surface chemists, there is one world here. And not the only view of that world, but one useful view is to look at the C2 unit and see where the electrons are in it. So that's what I'm doing. And I don't wanna lose that in this age. So that's where we are. Uh, we are now one slide away from the end. I have taken all this time, but I think you can see why it took two and a half hours to do this. Uh, and we have this fighting. I think in the end, I, while I defend this simple orbital way of looking things, I don't want, I want to leave you with the idea of not to get impatient with there being no unique way to define a chemical bond. People will agree for the strong bonds. Of course, they'll disagree for the weaker ones. But I think that ultimately this is the, this is the opposing view to the physicist's perception of there being one truth. Uh, to me, that idea of there being one truth is precariously close to religion. Um, this is, uh, there are, I think that when you, if you were to get this thing, which will tell you there is a bond, it'll tell you that. And then it'll close the door. And I think what you've got to do as a human being is keep the door open, allow other views to come in. And there is this bond, chemical bond, push the concept to its limits, be aware that people will differ. And respect chemical tradition and be happy with things being fuzzy. It's okay, nothing terrible will happen to you. And you may be able to do more, that's what I've tried to tell you, by accepting that there are different definitions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Rosman. Uh, great talk, both the experimental, theoretical part. Now, if anybody wants to short question, comment. <laughs> Thank you. Just a single question. Uh, does your map of uh, states uh, of the C2 molecule include uh, Rydberg states or just valence states? Um, the, the, does it include precursor, did you say? Rydberg. Rydberg states. No, I don't have the Rydberg states. But if the Rydberg states, if you mean excitation to higher orbitals, it's, it's actually an interesting thing uh, whether Rydberg states can provide some bonding over just being ionized. Uh, uh, let's see what I'm, I, I once did some calculations um, on benzene and I put in uh, D orbitals. Enjoy it very much, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, my question goes to one of is per, perhaps marginal to what you said. Uh, it goes in relation to this uh, vibrational spectra of, uh, of stars. Um, yes. And not so 
weeks ago, um, I recall now that uh, a friend of mine that, that is conducting a PhD thesis in astrophysics and has one of his first, pa first papers on elucidating infrared or vibrational spectra of the light of the stars. And I was uh, uneasy uh, on seeing what they propose as the source of these spectra. It was six or seven molecules. And uh, I thought, um, how much you, you can trust these results? Uh, how do you see that uh, part of the chemistry, of course, that is dealt by physics anyway? Yes. But can we expect some novel chemistries from these observations or these uh, interstellar media? Okay, those are two separate questions. Um, let me just get to those pictures of some of those stars. Yeah, yeah. So you will, part of this is that these are very precise observations. These are, these are not like um, they're not like this. This is a, a typical student organic spectrum of propanol. But you see the lines, you, I haven't pointed, but the, the, this is in wave numbers here, 1500, 2000. Now you look here and that's, they are switching over to gigahertz. I should have put this in wave numbers. These are these are very precise measurements. So there is something there that's giving a line and absorption. Very often they have a light. There are two, they either do it in absorption or emission, most often in absorption. Our observation recently, for instance, of atmosphere of, of exoplanets is also happening in, in absorption. So there's a light source behind this is light. The numbers are very precise and theoretical chemistry um, can be used to predict some of these numbers. A number of species have been found in the interstellar medium that do not exist on earth. Cyclopropylidine, I think is one of them. There are a few other carbenes and other unstable molecules. So, what is happening there is they are out in the cold and they're sitting there and they're going to sit there forever because there's not going to happen any collisions to not happening any collisions is an interesting problem because if you have if there's a chemical reaction um, then you you need a collision to take away the energy the other thing is uh, that they are they are sitting out there in the cold um, and the concentrations are very low. So certain uh, chemical reactions we think of normally would dissipate. I mean, the atmosphere is full of water, which is an acid in the base. So you can't, you can't have things uh, like radicals, diradicals very much. In, but uh, sitting on stellar media, you can have those. So you can, the, the most striking thing to me is, is H3 plus. So H3 plus is probably, it's a cyclic molecule of bond lengths. Uh, uh, it's, I keep wanting to say 0.85, but it's very, it's rather strongly bound with respect to, uh, I know by, by 420 kilojoules, relative to H2 plus H plus with no activation energy. H plus and H2 give H3 plus. H3 plus is the most abundant form of hydrogen in the universe, but it's not found on earth, except in the laboratory when it's made. So why is it the most abundant form? That's because the stars make, uh, the stars are mostly hydrogen and helium. These things uh, ionized coming out of stellar atmospheres, a uh, great source of H plus, H plus reacts with H2, which comes from H plus H going H2 uh, in the stellar atmosphere. 
so you get H3 plus, and then it stops. And that's, uh, but the H3 plus on Earth, so you can look up a table of proton affinities in Wikipedia, and what you'll find that the only thing which, the only things which do not steal an H plus from H3 plus, equilateral triangle, very stable, but it's uh, H3 plus plus anything is thermodynamically downhill except for helium and a little bit of an oxygen, but also other noble gases, uh, except for xenon, I think. Anyway, the H3 plus, unless it is in a, um, it will just persist in interstellar space. On Earth, people have tried, Jeremy Burdett tried to have a paper about, can we make a complex, organometallic complex? It's, it, the proton will be stolen by anything around. And so you can't do it. So this is an example of different stability. I think this is pretty impressive. It just shows how chemistry penetrates everything. So thank you. I think that let's thank Professor Hoffman again for such a nice talk and product. So thank you.